Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. Welcome to Energy Unplugged. I'm Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora in APAC. We're delighted today to be joined by two guests, Chris Gregg, Senior Research Scientist in the Andlinger Centre for Energy Environment at Princeton University, and Richard Bolt, Principal of NAUS and also Chair of Hydro Tasmania and an Energy Transition Advisor to the Secretary of the New South Wales Treasury. Both of our guests have had illustrious careers spanning public and private sector roles, but what's brought them here today is their recent collaboration on an ambitious modelling project called Net Zero Australia, which offers granular insights into what it will take to decarbonise the Australian economy by 2050 and builds on the Net Zero America report published in 2021. We'll be discussing both Australia and America during this podcast. Chris, Richard, welcome to Energy Unplugged. Nice to be here. Thank you, Hugo. Thank you, team. We're also joined today by Julia Hoos, Head of US East at Aurora, and James Ha, Australian Research Lead. Julia James, thanks for being here as well. Great to be here. Likewise. Thanks, Hugo. Chris, maybe I'll start. Uh, for any of our listeners who have might not heard about the excellent Net Zero America or Australia reports, can you briefly outline what they aim to do and how you went about conducting the study, basically? Sure. Um I guess when we started Net Zero America, we wanted to do something that was very different from the the majority of models uh, and studies that were out there. You know, most of them are fairly high level. They lack any spatial temporality and they don't really show you what needs to be done at at the level that planners and policymakers and even the private sector needs. And so we really sought to 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 really get it to be visceral and granular. We did that in a couple of ways. Um, Firstly, we had an unprecedented level of technological uh, resolution, lots of different technologies, all the sectors of the economy. The second thing is we we respected the fact that the future's uncertain. We can't say for sure how the costs of, of different technologies are going to unfold over time. We can't um, predict what the public is going to accept or not, uh, et cetera. And so we came up with five notionally different scenarios which would reflect these uncertainties, the uptake of electric vehicles and and home heating, um, very high renewable deployment, something that was more constrained and more relying on CCS and nuclear and so forth. Uh, So that's the first step. The second step was a thing we called downscaling where we essentially created these custom algorithms to cite the individual assets more or less at a postcode level as the scenario went on. And so you you will recall from Net Zero America, and it's the same for Net Zero Australia, we had these maps and they showed every five years just how the landscape was changing, where the solar and wind would be built, where the transmission lines would be, pipelines, CCS projects, and so on. And it was really that granularity and that spatial resolution, I think, that that really attracted policymakers and the media and 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 business to to the work we'd done, and and that's what we're now continuing. I should just say that it also allows you to draw out to unpack things like employment trends at local levels, mm. capital flows, land use, and other environmental impacts like pollution. So, so it was a really valuable guide for policymakers. I think that spatial point is a really important one because if you want to sell these kind of visions to politicians saying there'll be lots of construction and jobs in their regions, and my understanding is most of the money for the IRA is going to Republican states, I'm sure that increases the stickiness of of the policy as an example. We hope so. Hugo, I might just say that Net Zero Australia had um, an interesting uh, genesis that... uh, really began when a group of people were invited to a meeting a week before our COVID lockdown started here in Melbourne to, to, in a sense, wring our hands about how it was going to be possible 
to have a debate and indeed an evidence base for uh, what net zero actually entails for Australia. The concern was that, that the task was being oversimplified by much of the public debate and in much of the analytical uh, input to that debate. Um, and at that stage, I certainly, and I suspect most of those at this meeting, weren't aware that in the supermarket of, uh, of uh, modelling tools that would allow that very comprehensive view to be taken, there was really only one product, uh, and that was Net Zero America uh, and, uh, and, and the work that Chris and his team and his colleagues were doing. And so uh, it just happened that we were asking that question right at the time when Net Zero America was getting to the point where it became a replicable opportunity for an Australian project. That's great that we're starting to get into some of the specific nuances and, and making sure that it's applicable at the local level, because exactly as you point out, that's what makes it highly relevant in the two specific markets. And before we go into some of those specifics, I'd actually first love to take a step back and look at the big picture across the, the studies. Maybe to, to Chris first, what are some of the consistent themes that you saw in your results across countries? Maybe it's accurate to say that the modeling across the board aligned on a couple of um, various scenarios. So growing adoption of the technologies that are already crucial, regardless of how other technologies evolve, and then really starting to see what are the specifics at the local level for those more, uh, for those less mature technologies. So maybe pointing out a, a couple of specifics, you talked about electrifying as much as possible across the board, continuing to improve efficiency, expecting then electric demand to, to almost double in some geographies. You talked about using wind and solar as a, as a backbone, again, across geographies, and then building out the transmission needed to get that to where it needs to go. Batteries, for example, as a newer but, but already deployed technology for daily balancing, and then starting to answer those questions about seasonality and the re remainder of decarbonization, and really digging into what's what's possible on the more expensive technologies, green hydrogen, CCS, nuclear, et cetera, that are really gonna be specific at the, at the local level. Is that a fair summation? How else might you talk about the themes across the board? Yeah, that's a fair assumption. And I would say, I would just add to that, that the first third to half of the transition in terms of assets on the ground is dominated by the electricity sector. Uh, but then beyond 2030 or 2035, you start to see kind of quite rapid expansions in these other technologies like CCS, like hydrogen, um, So, and, and in some scenarios, nuclear. Yeah, and really also looking at increasing the pace of, of wind and, and solar and, and renewables in the short term. Yeah, in fact, in fact, for for net zero America, we need to see a doubling of historical maximum deployment rates throughout this decade, double again next decade, and almost double again the following decade. At the same time, we need to triple transmission over that period. So these are really quite heroic expansion rates. Julia, can I just chip in with a couple of additions that were relevant to Net Zero Australia? One, I think, also to Net Zero America, although Chris would be better off confirming that. One of those is that there was an enormous uh, modelled um, demand, you might say, for firming capacity in the form of gas-fired peaking generation, not using a great deal of the commodity, but a very large build and in capacity terms greater than the current coal fleet in Australia in, in particular. And there's a variety of reasons that we could go into for that. Um, also, I think this was a difference with Net Zero America, that there was a piece of work separately done on the land sector, and that revealed an enormous need, to, a substantial need for uh, sequestration in what you might call the biosphere in the land sector. Um, and, uh, uh, and it's worth just emphasising that uh, to close the gap, and I think, Chris, this is relevant to both studies, direct air capture, renewably powered with CCS was modelled to be uh, the, the, uh, the net zero um, uh, gap closer, you might say. And I think these are important points to make because they're sometimes lost, I think, in the uh, analysis of what we've done. Richard, can I just pick up on that gas point? Because, you know, Aurora obviously does long-term electricity modelling and, and we do see a role for gas, potentially with CCS over the long term or, or hydrogen-fired, whatever it might be. But I, I take your point that you've built this massive electricity system because you've electrified everything, but you still have to cope with solar and wind droughts. Batteries can't typically do all the work. And, and so there potentially is a role for gas. 
I, I'm certainly not a gas infrastructure expert, and maybe this is a level of granularity beyond what we should be talking about. But my friends in the gas industry do say it's very hard to run a gas system where you don't need to use much of it. But when you do need it, you need lots of it. And so you'd actually need to do quite a yeah. lot of spending, not just on the electricity network, but on the gas network to be able to um, you know, provide that level of gas infrastructure supply. Is that something you got into or? or... Um, no, I don't think in the case of Net Zero Australia, we were that granular, but I'd make the more general point there that um, uh, when you, if you assume a great deal of reduction in the use of gas in its current bulk um, uh, applications, you mm. might say, then you're going to have, you know, in theory, you're going to have uh, some latent or spare capacity available to provide those surges of uh, of gas for um, peaking purposes. But there's no question at all that the utilisation of that is going to be very low, very peaky, very intermittent, and uh, and therefore, in in an insurance policy sense, it's going to be it's not going to be a trivial cost. But mm. I think, Chris, we would have estimated that the overall insurance product is is still a relatively cheap alternative to any to the next best, uh, whatever that might look like. And we can go into what the alternatives are. And maybe, in fact, I should hand that that question to Chris, who's better qualified to speak about it. Mm. Yeah, in Netero America, we definitely looked at the impact on the utility sector. So these large pipelines that are carrying natural gas and and the utilisation does drop down a lot. And so there is a problem of stranded assets over time. And then, you know, it is inherent that if we're going to get to net zero, it's not natural gas that we're burning in combustion turbines mm. and the like in 2050. It's actually clean, you know, whether it's renewable gas or hydrogen, it's one of those. And if it's hydrogen, it's not clear that all of the existing infrastructure will be able to be repurpose mm. for hydrogen. So so I think there is a fairly significant capital um, redundancy problem in, in that in that transmission sector. And it highlights mm. such an important feature there, Chris, too, of, of the use of of models here is that we make sure that they're really taking a look at reliability and system operation and not just taking in, into account what new comes onto the system, right? I think that that's really something we we try to focus on at, at Aurora. What happens for how do you how do you really keep the lights on realistically over time as as you navigate the transition? Yeah, we, we don't have a perfect 870, 8760 hours per year model throughout the expansion horizon. Uh, but we do look at that temporal variation at an hourly level, uh, mm -hmm. picking select, you know, sample days throughout the uh, throughout the seasonal changes. So, so I think we have a reasonable uh, estimate of it and a reasonable accounting of it. But I wouldn't say we have a very detailed accounting of the reliability issues. That's that's kind of separate work that has to be done in addition to what we've done. Right, and, and particularly at the at the local and at the granular level. But you've touched on something, Chris, I think that, that is a really a great segue to, to a question I want to ask, which is really the right way to use these models. You've both been very outspoken ab about this on what these models can and, and what they can't do. And even the forward to, to the report says that the, the scenarios won't prove to be right but they're going to provide a compelling picture of, of what possible paths are forward. So Richard, you're coming at this as a former very senior policymaker. And then Chris, you've built and operated these very sophisticated models as well. How should we be using these models? And, and what are your reservations to, to relying on these models looking forward? Oh, look, I, I guess I can start, but it's probably I should give credit to Chris as far as this particular project is concerned in keeping us very clear in our messaging and uh, about that, about those limitations, that there is no such thing as perfect foresight um, and that to overinterpret results such as this can lead you to be quite literal about what they're telling you, whereas in fact, what they're providing you is, is a thought stimulus, a set of illustrations which have some explanatory power, but are necessarily extremely, uh, have to be qualified by the uncertainties that the future always brings. As a policymaker, that's how I've always tended to use modelling. It's to be very aware of the assumptions and uh, and the role that they and the algorithms that process them play in presenting results in ways that might look like they're predictive, but in many ways are almost a necessary consequence uh, 
of of the uh, of assumptions which are open to question. So it, it, the important thing is to run uh, is to understand the limitations, not to overindulge the com in in uh, the complexity of the design of models. Uh, choose those that are fit for purpose and interpret with great care. Use them as an aid to judgment. Um, and recognise that in five years' time, when you rerun them, you might find you've got very different results. And so what you need to do is to use them to make the decisions you must make now and and, and make very, uh, how can you put this, uh, make sure that the results you're relying upon are quite robust across the various scenarios you've run. So I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it's a, it's it's a, an aid to judgment. You've got to look into the future. You've got to have some view of the future. But on the other hand, You've got to be very careful about taking these models literally. Yeah. And I'd just add that, I mean, the whole reason we have multiple scenarios is because we can't predict these uncertainties. So to, so to suggest any one scenario or any of the scenarios would ever become reality, that's, that's fanciful. Uh, but hopefully they give some guidance. I think the other thing is that over, over and above uh, what the future system might be, look like, which is what the scenarios try to tell us, there's a question mark between translating the model uh, trajectories and real world implementation. So as Richard said, the models benefit from perfect foresight. They simulate investors who are very confident in the future uh, through perfect foresight, who have perfect visibility across sectors, who cooperate harmoniously and who materialise assets as and when they're needed overnight. Now, we all that know... That does not sound like the Australian or American energy sector, in my it, experience. It is, it is not any energy sector. Uh, so it's not any economic sector. And so, you know, we have to, we have to respect that that's an important limitation. It doesn't mean models are not useful, but we have to be very cautious about what we conclude from them, as Richard has said. There's another point here that I sometimes reflect on, and Richard, this is more kind of amateur psychology. It would be good to get your thoughts here as, as a former very senior policymaker. And I think about this in terms of Aurora's models, like as they've got more and more sophisticated, everyone wants to see the modeling, right? So you can't get any policy up in Australia without detailed modeling. But as they get more sophisticated, they get harder and harder to understand for non-experts. And so while, you know, particularly senior politicians generally want to see the modelling, they don't fully understand it and they don't necessarily completely trust the results because, for example, in electricity system modelling, how many weather years have you taken into account? What reliability standard you're assuming? Like all of this stuff is very difficult to understand. So there's these twin tensions as models get more sophisticated between I have to have the modeling and I don't actually understand it. So in my gut, I'm going to insist on a 25% capacity margin or, or whatever it might be. It kind of almost reverts back to gut decision making. Do you think that's fair or is that an oversimplification? Well, I, I think in some cases, yes. And by the way, I should say to talk down, uh, it might sound like we're talking down this modelling. This modelling is hmm. terribly powerful that we've just done, hmm. right? If you look at what it says about a renewable future, the land use change associated with it, the investment required of it, the associated use side that uh, investments that are needed, I think it has enormous explanatory power. And when you look at the different scenarios, again, changes in assumptions and the great shifts that they can can make in where investment happens and what kind of mix of investment occurs. Again, great explanatory power, simply not predictive power in the sense that uh, that some people would like it. So to your question specifically, yes, I think some people in the policy world react uh, with great reservation about modelling, don't trust anything, you know, don't, don't trust the numbers, build a lot of conservatism into the way they interpret it. I think others take it very literally. Mm. If they hear what they want to hear, Back to your point about amateur psychology, Hugo, if they hear what they want to hear, they leap on it, don't examine it critically and treat it as gospel. And, and equally, those are, I guess you would call them, uh, equally undesirable ways of using it. Um, what we're trying to do with this project, and I think have largely succeeded at, is to, is to present um, enough calm explanation of what the results actually say that anyone who, who looks closely or even just looks at the presentations that we've given can get a good sense of just how far you can take the interpretation and and how much you should approach that interpretation with caution 
And in the end, you say gut feel. Well, in the end, it does come down to judgment. You know, if you want to solve a complicated problem that makes a lot of assumptions about the future that simply can't be predicted, you really have to look at the problem, which is the way I went about it as a policymaker, from as many angles as you can, talk to as many people as you can, uh, run as many scenarios as you have the resources to do, let that, that cog cogitate over it, let that kind of settle in your mind. And out of that comes a direction about what am I going to do next? That is the best judgment you can make at that point in time. And I can give you mm. many examples where uh, I did that with all of those imprecisions about or uncertainties about the future. Um, and, and I think in some cases made mistakes and in other cases got the call right. Mm. Richard, I think if we could dive a little bit more into the details, particularly for Australia and in terms of what the study has actually found. And you've mentioned that you think the models have a lot of explanatory power, not necessarily predictive, but across the scenarios, you know, even if the results turn out to be a factor of two different to what the study has said, there's still a huge amount of infrastructure that's going to be required to solve for a net zero future. And you know, particularly for Australia to continue its role as an energy exporter to the world, it seems like we'll need clean energy export hubs with solar and wind farms spanning areas, you know, as large as the state of Tasmania for Australia and in the US, you know, wind farms covering all of Illinois and Indiana. Um, and you mentioned earlier, like alongside doubling the generation infrastructure every decade, we need to also triple the rate of transmission deployment. So, you know, bringing that all together, it sounds like there's an enormous investment opportunity here. And I'm interested, you know, although investors don't have you know, perfect foresight over the future and, and mistakes will be made, um, there is nonetheless a real potential um, for an enormous amount of capital to flow into the energy sector. And I'm curious where you guys see the capital coming from. And Richard, particularly in Australia, do you think it will be private firms or state-owned enterprises, either you know domestic or foreign, that are largely driving that investment? Yeah, it's a fine question, James, and one that Chris should speak to as well, having spent a lot of time thinking and analysing on this. But from a practitioner's viewpoint, um, in the Australian setting, the answer to your question, I think, is that the sheer scale of the capital requirement and the sheer diversity of the projects that need to be developed uh, are really beyond the private, the public sector's capacity to, in a sense, dominate and and to in fact do in its entirety. Um, uh, I think that the the practical realities are um, that it's going to be largely private capital. It'll be largely private development. That will be nuanced jurisdiction by jurisdiction, depending on the history. So a state that has got actually a still publicly owned uh, electricity sector. Uh, may find that, that more of, or may decide that more of the capital will come from there. But even in those cases, I suspect that a good deal of private capital will still come into the mix in many of the jurisdictions that, that, that have that history. Um, and, and bearing in mind, of course, that we're also talking here about transforming the oil and the gas sectors um, and uh, all of the use technologies that hang off those. And in fact, they are the largest part of our current energy consumption and are all currently privately owned. I don't see that the the public sector has, has really got the capacity to actually do all of that investing. What I think it has to do is step up a great deal to guide the investing, uh, mm -hmm. to help de-risk the investing, to explain it, um, and to ensure that it is publicly uh, acceptable and politically tractable. Now, that is an enormous task of itself. It does involve a different kind of capital, an enormous amount of political capital. And that, I think, is going to be the main role of the public sector in all of this. But I'd be keen to have that, uh, to hear what Chris has got to say about that too. Yeah, I, I think the capital mobilisation challenge is a central challenge. Uh, if you look at Net Zero America, our, just on the supply side, the infra essentially the decarbonisation infrastructure, um, we estimated between 8 and a half and $14 trillion by 2050 US dollars. Uh, that's about two and a half to four times more capital that, than would traditionally be allocated by the energy and industrial sectors. If we go to Australia, it was between seven and nine trillion Australian dollars, which was closer to five to almost seven times as much, in part because of the very capital intensive nature of green energy exports. Now, these 
these capital mobilisation uh, numbers are beyond the reach of the existing energy ecosystem. So by that, I mean uh, developers, energy companies, whether they be state-owned or otherwise, um, bank, you know, project financing banks, uh, investment funds, etc., cetera, uh, because they don't have the risk profile. So that, you know, we know there's an enormous amount of global capital available, 130 trillion, according to Mark Carney. Uh, but the majority of that doesn't have a risk profile that says, I'm going to develop and build greenfield assets. Mm. And so this has got to be a key role of government, right, is to somehow unlock more sources of capital by lowering the risk uh, or at least um, doing something in the, that affects the risk protocols of these companies. So I, you know, we know the, the, the transitions can be affordable. If we think about energy costs as a percentage of GDP, we think it's affordable um, mm -hmm. in all of our scenarios, you know, plus or minus. But, but the capital formation requirement in such a short time, I think, is, is really the central challenge when it comes to money. Definitely. And the narrow time frame within which to hit you know, both net zero and even in the more immediate term, you know, the intermediate targets that governments have set for decarbonisation, for renewables, um, it really does feel like it's a speed problem at the moment. I think if we could turn to Australia, Richard, on the, um, you know, we have a 82% renewable target by 2030. We've also got a 43% emissions reduction target by 2030. Um, both of these targets you know, are ratcheting up the level of ambition compared to where governments have been previously. Um, and you know, one of the focuses of the studies that you guys have done is really around the mobilization phase. So taking it that next step further, you know, what actually needs to happen now in order to get where we want to go. Um, and I'm interested, Richard, in what you think is the most meaningful steps that you know, Australia can take to accelerate its decarbonisation trajectory and get on the pathway to hit the goals that governments are hoping to, to see realised. There's quite a few uh, key steps that do need to be taken, James, towards, towards those very ambitious targets. Uh, I think that um, one, of the, uh, one of the gaps, perhaps, or one of the challenges is to back targets with genuine mechanisms that will mobilise that capital. Um, uh, mm. and, and that, again, it's, it's always going to be a mix of, of private and public, but, but with a significant emphasis on the need for private investment. Um, there is perhaps more emphasis, or has been more emphasis, on setting targets that appear to be necessary to meet emissions goals than there has been to develop the mechanisms that will actually make those targets happen. And I, I, I would venture to say in general terms that the, the mechanisms uh, are now the big challenge. But backing, uh, but associated with that, there's a need to, in a sense, bring the public along in areas where these challenges or these uh, investments will occur. Um, and there are a large land use changes that are associated with the largely renewable investment program. And, uh, and to bring the public along to share the benefits to, to make it possible for uh, uh, transmission lines to be built where they currently aren't, wind farms in, in large numbers to be, uh, to be established uh, are, I, I think, going to require a, a, a ramping up of the engagement of those local communities. And separately from that is the need to, I think, become very uh, focused on ensuring that the costs of all of this are reasonably allocated across the Australian community mm. and are kept to the kind of level that that is acceptable to uh, to people who up until now, in many cases, feel that what they're being promised is decarbonisation with reduced bills. And that appears mm. to be uh, you know, less likely to be true than perhaps earlier promises would suggest. And uh, until there is a, a perhaps a more realistic, while ambitious reckoning of how this is going to affect different communities, how this is going to affect the general consumer, how industries are going to transition, then I suspect there will be a consistent um, tension between aspiration and acceptance, if you like, aspiration to get it done and acceptance of the consequences. Mm -hmm. 
does feel like there's been a little bit of a roller coaster from you know initially decades ago everyone thought decarbonization and switching from fossil fuels to renewable electricity was going to be horrendously expensive and then over the last few years consumers have really been promised the exact opposite you know we've seen the lcoe of these technologies come down um but there does seem now to be a growing recognition that you know all in when talking about decarbonizing the entire economy and the scale up of infrastructure that requires um, the firming that that requires, you know, it's not so simple as just looking at those learning rate declines for solar and thinking that will translate directly into, into the consumer hit pocket outcome. James, there's another interesting exercise that's worth doing. You talked about speed. Now these targets are 2030. It's almost 2024. Mm. So if you know it's very easy to say 82% renewable energy turn that into a gigawatt figure and which it comes in at something like 165 and then ask yourself what does the pipeline of projects need to be today in 2024 to mm. be operating in 2030 now most mm. of these large projects take 5 plus years to go from being conceived feasibilities permitting, financing, and construction, uh, you know, that reverse engineering exercise can be enlightening, and I think we need to do it a lot more often. Definitely. And, you know, 82% of today's capacity is one thing, but given that part of achieving net zero means electrifying the entire economy, demand has to go up. So we're actually talking about a much bigger number than that. Yeah, and um, it's eighty-two percent of generation, actually. not capacity. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Can I add to Chris's point, James? That that and Chris has talked about the timelines with individual projects, which are always, uh, uh, you know, there's always going to be something that will cause those to dilate to increase. Um, but the the actual larger challenge, in some way, is that this is going to require many, many investments and asset closures to occur in a sequenced and coordinated fashion across a very large, uh, literal and figurative landscape of of assets. And that coordination task to have things come at the right time in uh, and various developments all at once and uh, to be coordinated with closure, um, that coordination task is quite substantial and there is additional potential for delay in the sheer complexity of just managing that transition. Uh, and all of which is doable, by the way. I'm not suggesting by all of this means that uh, throw your hands in the air and say it's all too hard. But I come back to my earlier point. You need the mechanisms. You need the governance. You need the uh, the, the scale and complexity of the task to be recognised by the resources and the approaches that you throw at solving it. And I think we're in the phase of recognising that and beginning to build all of those. But with that particular challenge of coordination and complexity comes further potential for delay. So you can envisage getting to a net zero target, but the early, very early, very large ambitious targets that are being set look a lot less easy to achieve. Mm. And that's certainly something we're seeing live on the ground here in the United States as well, post passing of the Inflation Reduction Act. I think there was a lot of excitement about the amount of capital inflow. And now we're really looking at on the ground feasibly. Can you get those projects not just into interconnection queues, but then can you actually get them built considering supply chain constraints, considering just the actual challenge of of interconnecting to, to the grid? So I might use that as a, as a transition point because the team has made some really, really interesting points about Australia. And of course, there's an equally great and, and fantastic report about net zero America. Chris, I want to pull out some of your findings there. But of, of course, the, the change that I have already teased here is that since then, we've had the, the passing of the Inflation Reduction Act where more or less right now celebrating its one year anniversary. And you already mentioned earlier that models then get updated, right? When when the input assumptions change. So what what might you highlight now that, that we're a year into the Inflation Reduction Act that you would want to update going forward? How might the Inflation Reduction Act change some of your modeling and, and some of your assumptions? Well, as you probably know, my colleague, Jesse Jenkins at Princeton has been running this repeat program uh, and he's been on really in real time updating the model in response, particularly for the electricity system, but not exclusively for these uh, uh, policy mechanisms in the IRA. And you know they they would suggest uh, we're not going to get to the Biden target of 
fifty percent below uh, two thousand uh, and five levels by twenty thirty, but that we might get part of that way you know, somewhere around thirty eight to forty two percent or thereabouts. Now, again, this is the model that has this benefit of materialising assets overnight. Um, I spend a lot of time engaging with the industry players. Uh, from what I see, the IRA does a good job of bridging the economic gap, right, the cost premium. Uh, and so the, case, the business case is making sense, particularly in wind and solar, and to some extent in some of the hydrogen sectors. But I think, you know, that it's this sheer speed problem and the sequencing issues that I th I'm quite not very cautious about what we might expect to see on the ground operating by by 2030 or 2035. I think I think where we don't quite have everything we need. I think we some some in, more infrastructure effort is needed. I think some more of this coordination function, more hands-on, more de-risking of, for example, backstopping demand for clean hydrogen, et cetera. Uh, yeah, so, so I think we're going to do okay on wind and solar, though I think we'll fall short. And, and we're seeing that with wind in particular because of supply chain and escalation of cost. Um, but I'm, I'm not as optimistic about clean hydrogen and CCUS as certainly as our models predicted or as it would take to get to, um, you know, pretty substantial decarbonisation in 2050, 2030, sorry. Right. And a lot of those logistical constraints that you were talking about really start to highlight then as you move forward, the need for hyper-local modelling and an understanding of, of what, what on the ground looks like in each particular geography. We've got seven competitive power ISOs in, in the United States and each of those function a little bit like, like its own country in, in some yeah. ways. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, we, we talked a little bit about the main findings that came out of the Australia report. And Chris, I want to get back in, in just a moment to what you highlighted on those newer technologies. But before we do there, can we talk a little bit about where the headline the headlines differ from the American report versus versus the Australian report? I think some things that jumped out to me immediately that you've you've already mentioned a little bit. Uh, as the the amount of capital deployment that we need grows substantially in the United States as a percentage of GDP stays somewhat consistent in, in Australia. And we've already talked a little bit about land use. The uh, United States has a lot of um, agricultural areas of, of the country. And, and so uh, biomass, for example, becomes becomes a larger portion of, of our, our findings here. What might you highlight as, as some of those key takeaways that are different for you and that are local? Yeah, so firstly, a little correction. Uh, in both the studies, energy costs as a percentage of GDP stay reasonably uniform or lower. Uh, capital uh, escalate, the, the amount of capital is enormous mm. in both cases, right? That three to four to five to six is across both countries. So capital mobilization challenges there for both. I think the, you pointed a couple of out. Biomass is a big issue. Uh, Australia is the driest continent on on the earth, driest con uh, con yeah continent on the earth, and of course biomass is a scarce commodity down there relative to to the US, where you know we have an abundance of it, um, and that has a huge impact, right? Because it's it's a valuable resource for some of the renew some of the fuel sector and and even the hydrogen sector. And it has the advantage, if coupled with CCS, uh, that it gives you a negative emissions footprint. Um, that is a critical part too, because CCS is actually easier to do in, in, in the US. Um, you know, we don't know as much about the CCS opportunity in Australia, but for sure it's unlikely to match what we can do in the US. In the US, we had two scenarios. Our, our modest scenario um, saw around a billion tonnes a year of CCS. Our higher scenario is 1.8 billion tonnes a year of CCS, both very aggressive deployment challenges, but the resource is probably there. In the in Australia, our base scenarios were more like 160 million tonnes a year of CCS, and we did a very high case of one, uh, 1 billion. Uh, but really, I think a lot more uncertainty on that front. And I think the other key one, of course, is nuclear is allowed in the US. It's it's illegitimate in Australia. It's There's a legislation against mm. nuclear power. So 
Mm -hmm. um, essentially, in Australia, you you have you got fewer options to play with. I'd love to follow up on exactly those topics, Chris, that, that you just dove into, maybe maybe starting with nuclear, because in in the report, it in fact does play a very substantial role um, in, in the U.S. going forward, depending on really the rate of renewable deployment that we see here. You've already touched on it. I mean, it's a it's a fascinating backdrop for for nuclear right now across across the world. Um, in the U.S., we're talking about expanding or extending current lifetime from a 60 year targets to 80 year targets. So that, de that debate really, really is on, on, on how we continue with nuclear, but then also um, you, you mentioned newer, newer nuclear technologies, for example, small modular nuclear um, playing a role going forward. And, and you see an increase in, in that technology. Um, how likely is it for, for those SMR technologies or newer nuclear technologies to play a role in the U S by, by 2050? How close are we there? Uh, look, I think we've got a long way to run on that. Um, I, I have confidence we'll find a way to extend the life of our existing fleet. Uh, I, it feels like that we have some SMR projects that are likely to get deployed. The costs remain uncertain, um, and that's going to drive how much we see. And most, uh, you know, as far as I understand, the two important demonstrations that are going on right now are significantly delayed and significantly over budget. Uh, so, you know, it, they're certainly facing headwinds, as we are in a number of technologies. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I hope they get to play a significant role because I think we're going to need them. You know, I, you might have guessed I'm pretty pragmatic, <laughs> having spent my life building uh, large-scale assets. And uh, so I, I, I sort of watch and wait rather than uh, pin my hopes on things. Maybe a quick follow-up, Chris, to that point. I guess this is a economic modeling exercise that you guys have undertaken. If that if the cost of nuclear remains very high or there are additional barriers put in the way of the technology, um, what is the next best alternative that the model would solve for? What do you see coming in instead and how would the energy mix change? Yeah, so we we still have a little bit of leeway. Uh, to do more CCS in, in the scenario where renewables are, are greatly constrained. But by and large, um, we would want to do more CCS and, and a lot more renewables. So in the scenario where we don't constrain things uh, and we end up building three terawatts of wind and solar in combination, and that's got about 900 billion tonnes a year of uh, CCS. That didn't have a whole lot of new nuclear. It had a few new nuclear plants. Uh, and so that one might be more realistic, although we're way behind the run rate on CCS and uh, renewables in that. So, you know, it's ideally we should do all we can to make these nuclear uh, uh, projects work. Uh, and and to be able to scale them up at at reasonable cost, but um, speed is time is our enemy. Mm, sure. Yeah, fascinating. I mean, it's really taking a look also the, at the existing energy systems uh, in the various geographies. I mean, many parts of the U.S. right rely over twenty percent, for example, on on nuclear generation. How do you manage the transition in, in a geography like that? You touched also, Chris, on on uh, carbon capture and, and storage. Obviously, a, a critical portion of decarbonization in the power sector that that we talk about. One additional new technology that you that you focused on in the report um, was direct air capture. One I think that that we speak about a little bit less. And and I might ask you the exact same question that I just did on on SMRs. Which for for listeners that are less familiar with with that technology, how close are we really also to to deploying direct air capture? Can you talk us a little bit through what those costs look like and and where they might need to go for that to be feasible. Yeah, so if you if you think about the cost per ton of CO2 drawn down from the atmosphere and sequestered, you know, you, you're looking at, at at least $500 a ton today uh, with projections that that could go to 200 and in some cases lower. Um, we don't know how far they can come down. Obviously, the advocates would talk that up. Um, you know, I'm excited to see the large-scale projects that are, that are being funded under the DOE hubs program, the Oxy project, the Climeworks project. Um, 
and they, we're going to learn an enormous amount from them. Uh, looking at uh, Oxy's plan in, or 1.5's plan in particular, you know, they're planning to build something like 100 of these projects over the, uh, you know, to 2035, depending on where costs land and how, how it all pans out. But, you know, if that happens, then, then, you know, presumably there's an opportunity to really drive costs down and it could be qu quite significant. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a side, an exciting opportunity. I think we've got a long way to run. The first ones at these sort of scales are only just coming out of the ground now. So we'll know in five years' time uh, just really what the potential is. And Chris, just on those numbers there, so $200 a tonne long term, you mentioned that um, some of the scenarios looked at sequestering potentially a billion tonnes in uh, for, for the US. Um, was all of that a billion coming from direct air capture? And if so, are we talking you know, $200 billion per year or is it coming partly from other ways of sequestering carbon? No. Um, so across the scenarios, it's the direct air capture is a relatively minority portion of carbon mm. capture and storage. So mm -hmm. bio, bioenergy facilities, natural gas, combined cycle plants, cement plants, this is where the bulk of it comes, uh, in particular from bioenergy because of the negative emissions benefit. Uh, yeah, direct air capture features reasonably strongly in a couple, but not dominant and relatively modest in the other three. That's been terrific. I'm conscious of time and you've already been very generous. Perhaps if I could f finish with one rapid fire question for each of you. Um, Chris, you've done America and Australia. What's next for the Princeton team? Are there any other countries on horizon? I'm thinking particularly here of Japan, where Aurora's um, been active for the last year, but has some very real constraints between land, a steep shoreline, you know, a whole pile of other stuff. Is there another country on the on the hit list? Yeah, so we're, I mean, we're pushing hard with um, what we're calling a net zero uh, X initiative. Um, so we're actively starting a project in India now with local partners. So as we did in Australia, the idea is this project is delivered by mostly local universities with mm. support with us. So we're doing this in India now. We're earlier days, but starting in China uh, and over the coming two to three years, we're hoping to get started in Brazil, Indonesia, Pakistan, and Nigeria as well, and Mexico. Uh, so Super yeah, we're, this list. is really exciting. Yeah, and and in fact, the focus going forward is really, and a lot of this is pending funding, but our focus is on, on identifying the biggest contributor to future global emissions as opposed to past global emissions. So mm. you can see why we're on those those uh, countries. Absolutely. And then, Richard, a final question for you, and, and we often debate this over, over coffees and, and breakfast. Who do you read or listen to in the energy space that you think is always good and thought-provoking and, you know, relevant to your work in the private sector now? I uh, I think uh, Energy Unplugged is an excellent resource, Hugo. Um, <laughs> I found I found your uh, your series on the Japanese market because I do a little work uh, in Japan, particularly uh, revealing, I guess, uh, and really uh, well kind of unpacked. Um, other than that, uh, I I really struggled with this because I thought about I've been thinking about well, where do I get my my uh, information from? Um, and to me, it's uh, it's really important to have a very diverse feed. So I'm going to duck the question and simply say that there are gems that you really have to go looking for because mm. it's an area that's replete with a lot of uh, of information sources that that are not necessarily getting to the heart of a pragmatic approach to decarbonisation. So yeah, I've got a variety of feeds, and in all of them, occasionally you get something useful. Um, and that's the way I go about it. It's to look for those needles in haystacks. Completely agree. Chris, just, I mean, very quickly, is there anyone who's your go-to? I'm sure you've, you know, Princeton, obviously, Jesse Jenkins, you've mentioned. Uh, we, I, I don't have a particular go-to, but I think for a sanity check and, and to um, just re get some reality, Buckclav Smill is always an interesting mm. read. Um, but, yeah, no, I think like Richard, Diversity helps. <laughs>
Absolutely. Well, on that note, Richard, Chris, thank you so much for your time. We've covered a huge amount today and we thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. That uh, was Hugo Batten, Managing Director of Aurora Enjoy. in yeah, APAC, talking Enjoy. to Chris Gregg, Senior Research Scientist in the Andlinger Centre for Energy Environment at Princeton University, and Richard Bolt, Principal of NAUS and also Chair of Hydro Tasmania and an Energy Transition Advisor to the Secretary of the New South Wales Treasury. They were also joined by Aurora's Julia Hoos, who's head of US East, and James Ha, Australian research lead. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.